Welcome to Sewing with Nancy into a three-part series that combines two of my favorite hobbies, gardening and sewing. The inspiration for this series came from Natalie Sewell, an art quilter and author who many of you met during the three-part series on landscape quilting. Natalie, it's always a pleasure to work with you and now to share this new idea of flower garden quilting. Thanks, Nancy. I'm delighted to be back and I'm eager to show our viewers how to make quilts like this rock garden quilt. What I like to do in these quilts is to take about a hundred steps forward and imagine myself um, actually working with flowers in the yard. We'll show you how to choose fabric, cut and quilt these wall hangings and this will allow us to do indoor gardening all year round. Discover the joy of flower garden quilts next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is being brought to you by FOF, the largest European producer of sewing machines. FOF's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira thread from Germany with superior quality and smart packaging to make it a sensational value. Preferred by home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmore House, the publisher of innovative sewing, quilting, and craft books, including books by Nancy Zeman. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz, Collins, and Omnigrid. And Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. We're going to start by giving you the inspiration for the flower garden quilts. And Natalie, your inspiration comes from nature itself. Right. Uh, I'm a gardener like you, mm -hmm. and I've taken lots of snapshots of my own garden. But I've also leaned heavily for my inspiration on garden books that I used to use for gardening, not quilting and now used for quilting, and calendars and postcards and greeting cards are all sources of gorgeous flower gardens. And you could take part of a garden scene, the entire portion, ad lib. Right, and you can clean up your own garden when you quilt. <laughs> Get rid of all those weeds <laughs> right. and unwanted plants. The first fabric that we're going to look at is the background fabric. Right. In this case, I've used a hand-dyed piece of fabric that I'm very fond of. You know, when you, re when you look at a garden, what you really want to see are the flowers, and the dark background really mm -hmm. punches out the flowers. And this is emphasized, too, in this snapshot. You can see that the backgrounds are dark because we're so close to the right. subject matter. Exactly. If you can't buy hand-dyed fabrics, and they're mm -hmm. not always available to everyone, there are some beautifully uh, colored commercial fabrics that are available in batiks and uh, just dark variegated fabrics like these that we're showing you. We need the light and the dark. Right. As you say, for sunshine and shadows. We need to avoid solids at all costs. And we need to avoid sunshine and blue sky. Yeah. <laughs> because that's not what that's not what you see close up. Right. And it's not going to highlight any of these flowers at all. Right. Right. We're going to lose our sense of flowers and space that way. So we have an image here about 28 by 32. You can make this any size you'd like. We're working on the wall. Put, place up a piece of flannel fabric so that you can work on. We're not going to work flat like most quilts. This way you can see right. your quilting. And it's also very important to get some distance from your vertical surface. If you can get back 20 feet, great. If you can't, mm -hmm. use a camera lens mm -hmm. to get some perspective. We're going to choose fabric. First of all, the foliage and the shrubbery that Natalie has in this rock garden scene. And one thing you said to me a while ago is that you can never have enough green. No, all shades of green. Blue greens and olives go together, and all, all the yellows are terrific. The only thing to really avoid when you're choosing foliage uh, fabrics is something that has only two tones. It will be very flat. The original calicos that so many earlier quilters mm -hmm. used are just simply going to be dead in your quilt. Now the, another benefit, if we kind of look at your quilt, we have the same fabric, it's right here, but you've used both the right and the wrong side. It looks like two fabrics. It gives a sun dappled effect that's really lovely in gardens. As the sun hits some of the leaves, they look almost white compared to the others. So with this type of fabric, you almost have two for the price of exactly. one. Exactly. We have some smaller little images that are going to be cut out. So you can choose some medium florals. Mm -hmm. And you can see Natalie has little 
orange plus a little bit larger yellow, some pansies, which is cutting portions of the fabric. But then for the focal point, bigger flowers. Right, the tulips. We and go ahead. What, we, what we're using for, for the tulips is um, a very pale pink that actually doesn't really give a lot of drama to the piece. Not at all. And so what I've taken the liberty to do in these close-up flower gardens is to actually use uh, fabric paint and markers to give me very vivid flowers. And if your design didn't call for tulips, you could choose some other fabrics. But we want to point out, Natalie, this is like wallpaper. In nature, you don't have this mass of flowers. Exactly. In fact, in nature, a very lush looking garden will have only about three flowers for every 30, 40 leaves. And that's an important concept to remember. So we'll be using many more fabrics in the green area to support the focal point. Right. We're going to start by cutting some of the foliage and the shrubbery that we have, so we better get back our, our, our leaf fabric. This requires a little bit more delicate cutting, precise cutting, than what we've done if you, any of you saw our landscape quilting series. Right. There we were just cutting any old way, and I was actually encouraging people to cut very badly. Mm -hmm. But here we're a little closer, and as you can actually see the leaves, you want to follow the line of a leaf and, leaf and make a cluster of them instead of just the ragged cutting that we did before. And this can be done while you're listening to television. Oh, or absolutely. Passenger in the car, just take some time and cut some rambling areas. While Natalie's cutting, I'm just going to show you the shapes. They can be larger or smaller, right side or wrong side of the fabric. It's just kind of interesting, the shapes that are created for this. Now, after you've cut a, a, quite a few shapes, we're going to do some gluing. And this technique, I have to admit, I ha didn't do it exactly correct the first time I worked with it. Most people think they can get away with a lot less glue mm -hmm. than you actually really need. You need a lot of glue. This is paper glue we're using, and it you need to put it on very heavily all around the sides, not just a dab. Otherwise, by the time you get around to sewing your piece together, you will have lost your leaves and your flowers. We're going to start by creating a trail, and since we're working with a distant background, we're going to use the wrong side of the fabric as the right side, and we'll start making the rock garden. Okay. And I'll just kind of apply this here. We're going to start our little path going from the higher left side down to provide a little bit of support for the tulips that we're going to cluster in here. We're building a rock garden, so let the flowers just cascade any way you want. And notice how this just kind of evolves. I think it's amazing. The background fabric just becomes mulch and grass and takes on shape as you work. And you really don't, the eye doesn't worry about where the, where the garden begins and ends. And we're going to add a few little crocuses Natalie cut out of some fabric. It's amazing. When you start cutting sections of the fabric out, it takes on a whole new appearance. Notice how few flowers we have and how mm -hmm. much green. That makes a big difference. And I'll give you some more foliage to put okay. up. And we'll make the trail a little oh, bit uneven. Oh, that's good, Nancy. That's really nice. So we'll keep working, just adding a little bit more. Here, we'll give you some okay. little flowers. So you can see this is kind of fun how this looks. And after you put up a few, then step back, as Natalie said, 20 feet if you can, and just see, is this the way you want it to look? Sometimes I have to admit, I'm not very good at this, so I pin it up first, then glue second after I determine if I have the right placement. Well, don't forget with the paper glue that you can pull it off and re-glue, mm -hmm. and it That's doesn't true. really harden too much. So now we have our trail begun, the, the background fabric using the wrong side of the fabric, adding a few little smaller flowers. Our next step will be to add the focal point, the large tulips. Natalie and I took some time off to finish working with our trail, adding some more foliage, and then starting with the focal points. The, the tulips are the focal points, but Natalie, again, we're going to show our viewers the fabric and the magic that you performed on the fabric. Okay, uh, what I've got here is some tulip fabric, which is now quite shredded. 
it's the tulips are lovely shapes in all kinds of varieties just what you want for a garden quilt but they're very very muted in color and we wanted something very bright so we're using these fabric paints um, well, to so change their color you don't where you we're doing red but you're you're, you can use a wide variety of colors, and in fact, I've done that on several quilts. And you don't have to color within the lines. No, you can <laughs> like make the, a mess. And you could make some of your, you'll see a quilt of Natalie's a little bit later that has yellow tulips, pink tulips, red tulips in it. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be all one color. And then after you have done the coloring, then you can cut them out. And if you want your, your tulips to be a tiny bit smaller, as we said before, in the distance, don't follow the lines, just cut out the center of the flower. And it, as they get bigger, then you can cut out the whole flower. And this is, or let this dry a little bit, but you would do the cutting and just follow the shape, or as you, Natalie mentioned earlier, you can cut a portion of it so that you're just using this for the distance. We've made, or Natalie has made, the tulips in the distance about a third smaller right. than the foreground right. tulips, which we'll put on in a few minutes. And it just gives the illusion of distance. Also, yeah. another trick that I like to use is to use a little bit darker shade for those tulips that are going to be behind others. It gives the illusion of shadow and shade. So possibly you can see the one that has already been cut out is much darker and you have more of a magenta color or a right. burgundy color comparatively to the brighter red that we have for the foreground tulips. And the other wonderful thing about using fabrics this way with uh, fabric markers like this is that the original coloration will come through mm -hmm. and be darker just as in these examples. It, so you're really just enhancing the fabric and the graphic artist gets all the credit for making the <laughs> tulip. And nice shading and everything. We mentioned earlier when choosing floral fabrics it's more like flower wallpaper and this is a great example. You may not have tulips in your flower garden if you have roses or geraniums perhaps zinnias. We'll show you how to work with that. And one of the ways to do that is to cut the flowers any shape you want. These look all, like they're pretty much all the same size, but cut a, a, a rose a little bit smaller, and all you have to do is cut out the center of it. I'm, I'm eliminating the outward petals and just cutting what would almost be like a bud in the middle, which will give me a slightly smaller rose. And of course, there are no leaves to choose no. from in that fabric. So I'm going to take the same leaves that we used in our rock garden, these Christmas fabric leaves. But I like the other side. And I'm going to turn them this way. And we're going to show you how easy it is to make a rose bush. Put a rose there. Add a little more foliage here. Another rose right here. Maybe a little bud. Tuck that in there. It's amazing. And you have instead of tulip garden this time you have a rose garden and here we have another example this is looks like a zinnia and we have this is the same flower shape that we just cut out full size or smaller size and that way you could vary the sizes you, we didn't paint these at all you could also add a different paint or coloration but you don't have the have to use the fabric just as it is right and with the zinnias too turning them over gives them just a little bit of sunlight so that some can be right yes. side up, some can be upside down, and you create a lot of sun and shadow in your flower garden. Great, Natalie. The fabric we've been working on just to showcase the rose bush and the zinnias is the fabric we're going to use for the tulips, the leaf and the stem. I like to use a batik or a hand dyed fabric for the leaves of tulips and irises and daffodils because it gives you a little bit of variegation mm -hmm. uh, without any pattern, and that's the way these leaves look. So what we're going to do, Nancy and I can both do this, sure. is we're going to cut tulip leaves big and small. And you can do this with a rotary cutter at home when, if you choose. I do it sometimes with a rotary cutter and sometimes with the scissors. And I'm just cutting half circles, and then I'm going to even it out a little bit. Now some of our tulips are small and some are big. We have so all we're kinds of sizes, right. Cut a wide variety. In the nature nothing is one solid color because there's always shading and light and 
that's what you have with this fabric. So fabric choices are really very extremely important in this step. That's right. You can take all your so solids and use them for something else. <laughs> So I'm going to do some gluing to some tulips. We'll add some more tulips to the distance. Okay, I'll put some stems up here and we'll be moving down the hill. This is why it's very important, as you can see, to work on a background that's placed on your wall so that you can step back and, and see if you have things in the right perspective. Natalie, you said the glue works out well because you can take it off and put it back, replace or That's reposition right. it. People are sometimes afraid to glue because they think they really don't know what their design's going to be. But you can simply pick it up, re-glue later, and put it back and it won't be any stiffer. That's why I prefer glue for these nature quilts as opposed to other stiffeners or things to attach. This gives me great enjoyment. It's, it's a fun, creative way, and there isn't necessarily a right and wrong way of doing this. It's just whatever you think your garden looks like. I'm taking some of your leaves now. Okay. We'll just keep adding some tulips. You can see in this method of quilting, depth and proportion are extremely important And as we're adding different sized tulips. Natalie, when you get a few of those up, we still need some stems, but we'll talk about rocks because this is a rock garden. That's right. Grays and browns make wonderful rocks, and the tweedier the better. Rocks come in all kinds of colors. This is the original color of this fabric. Many of you probably have fabrics like this at mm -hmm. home. I like to use the reverse side in a rock garden because I want the contrast of the white. It looks very as if it's sun drenched. And to cut a rock, I'm just going to cut a little jagged shape. Lots of it will be hidden by the foliage, and this fabric is great because it's creates a sense of shadow right behind the rock there. I'm going to tuck it into our... And then I'm going to quickly glue some foreground fabric. We have larger leaves for this fabric that's oh, coming good. forward so that you can see the depth that's created. Again, we're using the wrong side of the fabric. Our rock garden quilt is quickly coming to a close. We would maybe need to add some additional foliage, some flowers perhaps. I'll just kind of stick Keep some up here. Keep your edge very jagged, the way there. rock gardens work in nature. It doesn't matter that we haven't defined the garden bed. And now you can see how we're almost complete with the design of this, and we'll show you more designs in just a minute. Now here are two other inspirations from Natalie. This time we brought the outdoors indoors. This time, this is a still life of sunflowers, and this is the fabric I used. Notice all the flowers face forward, so I had to cut them in creative ways to make them turn, mm -hmm. and I created a bud and darkened the centers, and that gave me that variety for the bouquet. And you did not use the leaf fabric that came with the flowers. No, it was too pale and too flat and too small, so I added my own leaves from two different fabrics. And working with light and dark is very right. interesting. Right. Over the garden fence or over the fence is what you see behind us. And this fabric we showed you earlier with the zinnias on it. And now you can see, Natalie, you just used a few flowers in comparison to the fabric. Right. I added at least 20% more leaves so that you have the sense of reality that real gardens have. Right sided leaves, wrong sided leaves. These are two excellent inspirations. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Nancy. In this first segment of the video on flower garden quilts, Natalie, we shared how to design a rock garden, but you have another rock garden or flower garden to share with our viewers. Yes, in this quite a bit bigger quilt, I used a multitude of tulips and went a little nuts with my fabric paint and painted them all kinds of colors and added some three-dimensional butterflies. It's very attractive. What we're going to do in the second program is share with you how to add a picket fence and make the flowers look like they're over the sunny side of the fence. Here's a hint from Nancy's Notions. Check out the Nancy's Notions website at www.nancysnotions.com. You'll find a wealth of sewing information and ideas. Each month I present a new sewing library article featuring a unique project or sewing tips from some of my viewers and mail order customers. Sign up for my online news and I'll send you my free email newsletter. 
You can also check out Sewing with Nancy program descriptions and uplink dates. And of course, you'll always find what's new in the exciting world of sewing and quilting. Here's a hint from Ginger. When I'm adding a decorative touch to a project and I need to trim really close to decorative edge stitching, an applique scissors makes that job easy. The curved handle ensures a comfortable hand position and eliminates stress on my hand and wrist, while the large bill efficiently lifts the fabric I want to trim away. I also use my applique scissors when I'm doing reverse applique for trimming fabric from behind lace, for grading seams, and to trim quilt batting. An applique scissors is the right tool for trimming away anytime, anywhere. Flower garden quilting is a topic of our current series on Sewing with Nancy. Natalie Sewell, art quilter, is my special guest to share her unique raw edge applique technique. Natalie, our first series that we did together on landscape quilting piqued the interest of thousands of our viewers, and I know they'll equally enjoy this series on flower garden quilts. Thank you, Nancy. The flower garden quilts do require some study of nature. Uh, in this quilt that we're going to show today, uh, the sunny side of the fence, mm -hmm. uh, I've pulled flowers and leaves from many, many different fabrics. It's fun to see how the choice of fabrics, cutting techniques, and quilting techniques create these great designs. Next on Sewing with Nancy. Natalie's quilt, The Sunny Side of the Fence, started out as an inspiration from a snapshot that you took, Natalie. Yes, that's my neighbor's fence, and it's an unfinished cedar fence, and I thought it would make a good uh, structural element in a garden quilt. But you didn't follow it exactly. This was the inspiration, and this is the result. That's the wonder of making things out of fabric. You can do what you want with the flowers. We're going to talk a little bit again about choosing fabrics. And that's probably the key to doing this, not only getting the inspiration, so. but fabric. And the background fabric is what we're going to talk about first, the sky. Now, the most people think of a sky, and they think of a light right. blue sky with clouds. But again, that, our flowers will get lost mm -hmm. in a background like that. And we're so close up that we need this darkness. Right. So something muted, various shades, you can see a lot of variety we have here, makes the flowers pop out. That's right. As long as it's not a solid, almost any of these commercial fabrics will work out nicely. Now, this design is a little bit different because about two-thirds of the background has this real interesting print that is looks like foliage. It looks like a wide variety of foliage from a distance. On our board, on our design wall, we have about one-third plus some yardage is the sky, and then two-thirds plus some additional yardage is the lower edge. And you don't really need to sew these two pieces together at this point. If you simply very roughly cut the green variegated fabric and simply glue it on as Nancy's doing right there, later on as you baste your piece together, and we'll be showing you how to do that, the two pieces will fit together very nicely and lay flat. Now this is just about 24 by 28. You don't have to make it that size, just to give you a proportion right. of the finished right. quilt. And there you have a good share of it completed already. That's right. And now we need to put in our fence. You know, fencing we'll, we'll discuss, but also oh, that's right. let's look at fabric. The fabric for the background, we have scale to talk about, and you're very good at determining scale, Natalie. What I'd like to do in the far distance is create the sense of additional shrubbery mm -hmm. by picking very finely uh, detailed fabrics. They look like they're further away because the detail is so much smaller. And again, in this case, what we can do is cut the way we do for landscape fabrics. And that's cut very rough and very badly, any which way. We don't have need to be precise with this because it's in the distance and we won't really see the details. So you want to just make it rough because nature doesn't like anything smooth. And I'll show you some of Natalie's pre-cut things that she worked on, that all the edges are very uneven. Yeah, you must avoid cloud shapes and lollipop shapes. Mm -hmm. And make sure that it's very, very badly cut. We'll, we'll place these up on the quilt in just a minute, but before we do, so you can see the different types of fabric we'll need, I'm going to point out some of the other styles of fabric, or not necessarily styles, but we have foliage and we have flowers. And this is what I think is a great comparison because this is precise cutting. But let's start with the geraniums. We have your geranium fabric. Here we go. Now this takes patience, and you better do it while you're sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> because what we're really trying to do is get rid of all the little black behind there. And so it's very, very fussy work. 
cutting very precisely until you come up with a piece like this. Remember paper dolls, how you had to cut out mm -hmm. the armholes? That's what you'll need to do to get this fabric. Now in choosing some other fabrics too, you can see that these little flowers poking out are in proportion. Natalie didn't choose these large ones, saved it for another quilt. She also has in this quilt some very small to, again, get some distance and different proportion. So choosing fabrics, I think, is what you start with and it will make the whole quilting process and designing process a lot easier. Right. Now let's talk about this fence because oh, yes. it's such an interesting detail of, of the design. And again, many of these uh, fabrics are just purchasable just the way they are. There's lots of wonderful wood tones in fabric mm -hmm. stores these days. And I picked one that looks like cedar. So we'll kind of fold back so we get a work surface. And this is where you've kind of changed your ways a little bit, Natalie. I've never seen you cut accurately with a Let ruler. Let alone measure. <laughs> but these pickets are two, two and a half or one and a, this happens to be, excuse me, one and a half inches wide. And you cut numerous strips at one time with a rotary cutter, right. mat, and ruler. And then you shape the top of the pickets. And this time you kind of did a free motion cutting and I'll hand you scissors. Okay. And what I do is simply put the put a series of these together, fold them in half, and simply create a picket informally by cutting this way. And if it's not exactly even, the picket fences usually aren't, especially if they've been weathered a little bit. That's right. Well, now start to design our quilt. We have the background fabrics cut, we have some of the pickets cut, we have our background ready, and as we've done in the past when working, we've worked with a fabric glue stick and some fabric that has been already cut out and just do gluing the background. So you add some glue, this is so that you can do some positioning. That's right. And again, we'll put these way in the distance here just to give a little variety to our background foliage. It works good to have this teamwork. <laughs> I know, I take you home with me. <laughs> and now you're adding some of the lighter greens. It's, it's really, you can see that depth creating as we are working with it. I think this piece is ready to go. And as we mentioned to you in previous shows, this fabric, for example, only has three or four tones. Mm -hmm. If you want to take a fabric marker and create another sense of depth, you're welcome to do that to create just a little more color. Very good. We'll show you a, a quilt further along in just a minute, but let's add some of the pickets right now. First of all, our... First of all, our fence post. And we'll just kind of... I think that looks we'll good. We'll just pin this one for now. Just make sure it's straight. And then our vertical posts. I'll give you one. And we'll to start. start in your corner here and just you can eyeball them before you glue them just to make sure they're straight. And our ruler, I think I have it to my side, Natalie. Here we go. And what you want to do is just make sure they're straight. They don't have to be perfect, but they should be somewhat straight. That's it. Okay. We'll add a little glue at the top here. And continue working across. The background foliage, as you see, will fill in between the pickets and give it a sense of realism. Now, one thing we also would like to do is add some depth, and quickly we can just add some shading between the vertical pens, fence posts and also add some nail holes. That's right. I like to just make this a little bit darker. Because it's recessed. And it looks yeah. like it's, shadow, it's in shadow there. Mm -hmm. And what's really fun is to make this... Oh, <laughs> and don't make them even. Sure. And then if you really want to have fun, you can make it a little rusty. We'll let you finish doing this, Natalie, and while you do this, then we'll get set up to do the next step of adding the flowers. We've added more picket fences to our quilt, finished adding the shading, and now we're ready to add the flowers. You saw the fabrics we chose earlier, Natalie, and now you've done all the pre-cutting for us. It's right. a lot of fussy cutting that you've done beforehand. And this would, again, just take some time. It means being willing to do something like this, that is cut out all the black. Mm -hmm. 
So now, after adding some glue to the wrong side, and we're not going to glue each piece, but you would at home, we're just going to quickly kind of transform our picket fence into a blooming fence. Yeah, this is the fun part. I'll do the geraniums. Okay, and I'll take care of these little orange flowers in the corner. And we'll use the fence because we'll tuck things behind it, have flowers blooming over it, the way it happens in real life. And we'll cluster these flowers very tightly together because that's really how they grow. Natalie used a photograph for inspiration for this particular quilt design. Seed catalogs, gardening catalogs are also great inspirations. Greeting cards. And calendars are just that's gorgeous right. and great sources. This is absolutely the, the most fun part. And you have, if you're working a design wall, which we highly recommend, then you can step back and see if you have it positioned correctly. And then I think I'll do the vining clematis here. Okay. Just keep adding. Oh, that looks great, Nancy. It's really fun to see the changes that are occurring. You almost can't go wrong at this part. As Natalie is adding some of the additional flowers, I'd like to talk to you about the foliage in the foreground. We've chosen fabric that has a larger foliage than what was in the background, much larger, because this is obviously closer to you in the image. Natalie has cut precisely around the edges, not rough cutting, but following the leaf shapes. And Natalie, how about adding a few of these to sure. your design? I'm going to put some over here as a yeah. foundation for gonna, the geranium. I'm going to tuck some of mine. Whoop, this is why you need glue. You have following foliage at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't always have to be so orderly either. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put some of those right there. And the wrong side as well as the right side works out very well for this That's right. fabric because it looks sun-kissed on the wrong side. So depending upon the look that you'd like, this is what we can achieve. Oh, now again, great. again, we would use a glue stick to position this down, but right now we're just kind of hoping that this stays in place and how quickly you can see it can change that picket fence. The next step we're going to do is go to the sewing machine and show you how to baste the, the fabric pieces in place. Natalie and I just finished gluing all the fabric pieces down to the quilt. If you recall, we kind of positioned those without doing the glue basting. Well, we took time to glue everything down. That's important for the next step, otherwise it will not work very well. Right. Set up your sewing machine for free motion sewing techniques. I'll show you how to do this, and Natalie's going to do the quilting. Use monofilament thread, either in the clear or the smoke, as I have here. You can use the same thread for the stippling technique, which we'll, use, or we'll show you later on in this series. And then use a metafil needle, the companion needle to this thread. You need an eye of the needle to be longer, which this needle has. The bobbin thread just is all-purpose thread. Do not use the clear thread in both the bobbin and the top. It will be difficult to work with. You need the all-purpose thread in the bobbin. And then a darning foot either the darning foot that comes with the machine, and that's what I have on my machine, and so does Natalie right now, or a separately purchased darning foot that rides above the fabric, doesn't hold close to the fabric, allowing you to use the free motion techniques. The machine is set for a straight stitch, but to make it free motion, you simply drop or lower the feed dogs. These little grippers that usually grab, grab the fabric are now lowered and they're out of commission. So now you're ready to do the stitching, and Natalie, you're set up for that. Okay, I'm going to just baste down the pieces we've glued. By basting, all Nancy and I mean is straight stitch sewing on the outside edge of each piece. And I can do it all in one motion. I'm just trying to hold the pieces in place. Later on, we're going to really quilt this. So this is just a basting technique. Exactly, we're not trying to outline the leaves or the petals. We're just getting it solidly down on the fabric. And you can do your pickets at the same time. You can see we don't have everything based, every edge basted down, but the majority of it, because there aren't any pins in this area, and you're just right. going around the outer edges. trying to make sure that our design stays in place while we put on borders and do all the other steps we have to do to make this a quilt. 
So you have some rubber fingers that help you hold the fabric? Oh, they're really useful. Some people prefer hoops, that's also fine. I just am used to this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of rhythmic. Notice how Natalie's moving the fabric. We're, you're not changing, you're, ch you're controlling it. Right, and it gets to be kind of relaxing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you one quilt that has some basting finished on it. We're looking at it from the wrong side. The wrong side is really a sketch, <laughs> a, a lot of meandering stitching. You may find that sometimes you may get a pucker or two. So if you have one, just give a stitch a clip, flatten it out. You could steam it out later on. But if the stitching isn't exactly flat, it's not going to matter. This is purely a basting technique. Now the next thing that we'd like to share with you is how to audition borders to choose what fabrics to complement your quilt. After basting down all the pieces of your over the fence quilt or rock iron quilt, whatever quilt you're making, the next step is to determine what fabrics to use as the borders. And Natalie, you have a keen sense of what fabric to highlight your design with, so I'll let you take over. Okay. What I like to do when a piece is this busy and colorful is to pick a border that's really serene mm -hmm. and peaceful. And one of the things that might be very tempting for a quilter to do, and I used to do this all the time with piece quilts, is to pick a quilt that has all the elements, pick a fabric that has all the elements that are already in there, but you can see that multiplying a piece like this by four around mm -hmm. the whole quilt would just be very busy and not give it any sense of peace. So I'm really tempted then to go to a fabric which has the same mood as the background and something like this would work yes. very nicely. However, it's so similar to that that I would want something to interrupt it. This would also work, which is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But So I'm looking now towards an inner border and thinking, wow, the red would be so pretty and this is such a nice color. But if I multiply that by four, it might be yes. too jarring. And it's really a small strip. It's only one inch wide for a half inch finished border. Right. And so I'm thinking that I might go to the yellow, which emphasizes those yellow flowers and makes the quilt feel very sunny, but is a lot less obtrusive. Yes. And so something like that, I think, would be a nice choice for this quilt. And you can see the results because that's what you chose in this finished quilt. And it really, that little inner border makes it pop, highlights it. Right. But you don't have to use borders. And one of the ways to achieve a very contemporary look is to simply skip the border mm -hmm. altogether and bind your quilt. I like to use a self-binding then, and it calls less attention to itself and creates a lot of tranquility in the outer edges of the quilt. This is the design that we worked with in the beginning program of this series. And so you can see whether you're working with a flower garden quilt, over the fence quilt, borders and finishing touches are important. In our next program, we're going to detail squaring the quilt, adding the borders, the techniques. Here we just wanted to give you an idea of choosing the fabrics so that you can get started on the next step of your flower garden quilt. <laughs> Now I'd like to show you Natalie's first introduction to flower garden quilts. It was with this inspiration of a photograph called Elaine's Window. Thank you, Nancy. This, this photograph was done by a photographer friend. And in the process of trying to reproduce it in fabric, I learned a lot about flower quilts. I learned how nice a dark background is. I learned I had to take the flowers from one fabric and the leaves from another. And I, it was a great experience, and I've made many more since. And now we'll have more ideas on flower garden quilts. Here's a hint from Madeira. Machine embroidery is a great way to personalize garments and home decor. When I do machine embroidery on garments for my sons or for the home, I want the thread that can stand up to the rigors of high speed stitching, as well as the challenge of repeated laundering. The new color fast poly neon thread fits both criteria. I'm especially pleased with the continued brilliance of poly neon even after repeated exposure to sunlight, chlorine, and machine washing. This 40 weight polyester filament thread also is extremely strong, so it resists abrasion and breakage. Here's a hint from Pfaff. On Sewing with Nancy, you've often seen me use Pfaff's exclusive dual feed. The dual feed helps feed the top 
and bottom fabric layers under the presser foot at the same rate. I find this especially helpful during machine quilting. The layers of the top, backing, and batting feed through smoothly. My dual feed also simplifies matching plaids as well as stripes. It prevents seams from puckering, particularly on lightweight fabrics such as silk and rayon. Whether you're doing specialty sewing or everyday seaming, Foss Dual Feed offers a real advantage. Here's a hint from Prim Dritz, the manufacturers of Collins quilting products. When hand quilting, use the patented no-slip hoop with a unique tongue and groove shaping system to keep your quilt layers perfectly taut and stable. Simply place the fabric over the inner hoop. Loosen the outer hoop. Slip the outer hoop over the fabric and tighten the screws. The tongue and groove molding will lock the layers in place. When quilting, the perfect companion is a finger pin cushion. Keep extra threaded needles or pins in this convenient mini pin cushion. The no slip hoop and finger pin cushion are ideal quilting mates. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. This is the third program of the series on flower garden quilts. Natalie Sewell, art quilter, once again is my guest to inspire us with her study of nature in fabric. Natalie, in the first two programs of this series, we worked with designing of the quilts. Today, we're going to add additional elements. Right, we're going to take a look at the quilt, Poppies Outside My Window, and first we're going to review the design process, and then we're going to add a structural element. We're going to add the, the uh, window panes, and then we're going to add the frame. Discover the joy of creating flower garden quilts next on Sewing with Nancy. We're going to start with a quick review of the design process of making the quilt poppies outside my window. Natalie, on our board, we have two fabrics that you started with for the backgrounds. Right. What I like to do is use a third of the fabric as the background. I like to use a dark one, either hand dyed or commercially uh, produced is fine. And then I'm using these grasses and all I've done is rough cut the top of the grasses and glued this top to the background. If you make a seam, you'll have to spend a lot of energy covering mm -hmm. it. This works just as well. So we have the background fabric, and now we're going to work with the poppies, your main focal point of right. this quilt. I pulled these poppies from this piece of fabric, which uh, has very pale poppies, mm -hmm. and in order to make them more vivid, because I wanted them to really punch out in this quilt, I've used a fabric marker to intensify the color. Color and first, can, excuse me. You can see that it really makes a difference. And then I cut them out very precisely. And some of these poppies were cut from the same shape, but you just cut them, scaled them down. Right, to get a wide variety of poppies, I, I cut some much smaller than they really are. Now, Natalie suggests using a glue stick to position. We're just going to quickly position some of these. And notice how that back, black background makes these poppies jump right out from the scene. And don't forget to give them stems. I used a piece of batik mm -hmm. to cut stems that will stand out from the background. And don't forget to use a few buds. Sure. Cut just from the, the flower itself. Right. And the grasses fit in nicely. I'm going to show you some of the grasses while Natalie's positioning them on the wall. One of the quotes we used from Natalie in the early part of this series was that you can never have enough greens. Well, to create this olive green, Natalie, you bleached this fabric. Right. Using three parts water to one part bleach. Test first. Test first and leave it in for a few minutes. Five is what I did in this case, but every fabric will behave differently. So it's just take a smaller portion, and granted, we're not using the glue right now, but you would position those with the glue on this area. We're going to magically peel this away to show you one of our other designs and show you this particular design. It's a little bit more coming to life at this point, and we're going to discuss working with the framing fabric. This is a beautiful piece of fabric. It has so much potential. Yes, and I thought that, you know, just instead of just having poppies, they take on such a different uh, value when they're seen through a window. So these new window fabrics, are, this wood fabric is just wonderful. And you cut the panes using a rotary cutter mat and ruler about a half inch wide from the lighter portion. Right. 
And then we're going to, we divided the top, by the way, into thirds. We already did this, so we'll just quickly position it and it's, do measure. Do it's measure. one of the very few times I do ever measure. And then we'll add a crosswise pane. Okay. Working together helps. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and you can see how this is starting to form into a window. The next step is to do free motion basting. We've reviewed this in an earlier program, and here you can see the technique of basting down the elements. Next, we'll show you how to add the frame. We took some time to do the basting down of the elements. We basted down the panes of the window as well as all the other little details of this poppies out my window quilt. And then, Natalie, off camera, you did some steaming and pressing. We pressed the quilt top from the back so that it would be totally flat, and now our job is to make a perfect rectangle by squaring off our quilt. Don't rush this process. This is a really important one. I like to start by taking one side of the quilt and turning it up to the other. Note that we, in, this, in this piece we have window panes and we need to match them. And they also help serve as a guide here. So we're going to match them and look, turn the quilt in half. And then I'm going to flip it so that you can see the grass at the side and then we're going to line it up from the top to make sure we have a total rectangle. And I'm going to cut. And then we repeat this step on the other side. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. So far in this program, we haven't used a lot of specific guidelines, but this is very important to cut accurately and measure accurately. Yes, because the finishing touches will determine whether you have a wall hanging. One more time. There we go. Or something rumpled on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> now I've had that. <laughs> then after cutting two sides, match those cut edges that have I'm been... I'm going to fold it the other way. Again, I'm going to try to match the window panes because that will be very important in our wall hanging. You mentioned sometimes it takes you hours to get your quilt square. That's right. It can be very frustrating, but it's worthwhile taking the time. And here, I'm going to worry about this line here and make mm -hmm. sure that it's straight. And then we're going to cut again. And you could do the same to the remaining edge. Right. It's, it's kind of hard to cut on an angle. There we go. Good. Now you want to also do one more check, and that's to make sure it's square. We, we didn't cut one of the edges, but I think you get the idea. What I like to do at this point, assuming I've trimmed all four edges, is to take a big square ruler that you can see through, like one of these, and make sure that I have a perfect 45 degree angle. And I think we do. Very good. Even the panes are straight. And I'll move this ruler all the way around the quilt. The final test is to put it on a vertical surface and measure top to bottom, side to side to make sure that the numbers all add up. In our second program of this series, we detailed how to audition borders, determine what fabric to use for the borders, but this is a given. Yes, we need a window frame. So instead of using the light shading from this fabric, Natalie chose to use the darker for the outer edge, cutting the borders half of an inch wider than the finished width, and this is the important part, about eight inches longer than needed. That gives you room to miter your corners, and it also gives you a little flexibility so you can vary those little knot holes in there. We have about four inches extending about each edge, and I'm going to place a pin a fourth of an inch from the cut edge, and each border would be sti stitched to the quilt a fourth of an inch from the cut edge, and then again at the lower edge a fourth of an inch to the cut edge. We're going to look at some samples that have this in process right now to show you the idea of mitering corners. Now, in the booklet that accompanies this program, it's detailed in great steps, but we'll just right. show you the process. We have two qu quilt corners in place. And what I like to do is simply take this edge, the top edge, fold it back, create a miter, and then press that down very smoothly in place. We have one already pressed here. And there it's been pressed, and then we're going to fold this back to show you the press mark. I like to pin put pins in here. And starting at this point, not at the bottom, put it in my sewing machine and sew along the press line. 
And then this sample shows the pressed and stitched seam. And when we press it open, we need to trim off the edge, but notice the beautiful miter. Do this on all four corners, and now we'll show you how to layer your quilt. We took time to put the borders all around our sample quilt, mitered the corners, pressed, and now we're ready to layer it. And Natalie, your favorite way is to choose a backing and then a batting. I like to choose a backing that has the same mood as the quilt itself. Then the quilt feels like a harmonious whole, even though you don't see the back that much. And then for I, I put a piece of batting between mm -hmm. the top layer and the backing. And then I like to pin very tightly in place. I try to place the pins so that they are no further apart than my fist. And that way it's anchored safely enough so that we can quilt and move the piece without having it shift. We're working on a cutting mat so that our table surface will not be scratched. And if you had a table at home, you want to put a cutting mat on this. And notice too that you can maybe see some masking tape around the edges. We've taped the batting, or excuse me, the backing to the tabletop to keep it nice and taut. Right. And I've actually, we've taped it in more than four places so mm -hmm. that we can count on it being really anchored. So we, we're going to finish pinning this into place and then we'll be ready to do the stitching. Now we'd like to show you how to set up the machine to do the free motion quilting. Natalie's machine is already set up for this and I'll just review the components. We're working with monofilament thread, a clear thread in either smoke or the clear color and a compatible needle like a Metafill needle. You need the two to go together. In the bobbin, use an all-purpose thread that matches your backing fabric. So Natalie has a navy blue in her bobbin. Probably the most important step is to lower the feed dogs. The feed dogs normally grab the fabric, grasp it, and help it feed through the machine. Because they're dropped, you can't see the little teeth in this area, you'll, be, you'll watch Natalie in a few minutes move the fabric around. The foot also enables that free motion. That's how it got its name, because the foot does not hold the fabric down next to the bed, but rather rises above. And here we have the darning foot that comes with the machine, or one that you can purchase separately. So Natalie, you already have that set up on your machine with a straight stitch, and you're ready to do the free motion, and it's called stippling, the, the random stitching. Right, and what you can do is just continuously move your machine. First I'm going to be doing some grasses, then I'm going to get to the flower, and I'll outline that. I'm running up the pane at this point. Now I'll go back down and do the stem. For those of you who are doing free motion quilting, try to start in the middle of your quilt. It ensures that you won't find surprises as you get to the corners of big bubbles. <laughs> now, stippling is much like sketching a picture or following an outline of a design. Right. And it's, it's just a repeated motion. Now, I'm, when I get to the sky, I'm going to start stippling. As I get near pins, I just remove them. I keep them in place until mm -hmm. I'm actually there. And now I'm going to show you the sky pattern or stippling that I do. I'm just making little circles with my hands pushing the fabric around. To keep the fabric stable, I'm wearing office fingers. Some people may prefer an embroidery hoop. And the, to make those poppies pop. <laughs> and then what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go in the middle outline, mm -hmm. and just wiggle around to get all the poppy seeds in place. Then I'm back out stippling again. There's no reason to stop and start again. You can just continually move your machine. The faster you go, the more even your stitches will be. So as you get better, you'll actually go faster. It's very relaxing once you get in a rhythm of, of working with this. Yeah, it is. It's very soothing. And then you can just go back to the grasses and continually quilt. This sample showcases some of the stitches that Natalie just showed us. On the front, you can maybe see some of the shine of that clear thread. And she could go from the hot orange or the red to the blue to the green without changing thread colors. On the wrong side, you would work with matching thread to the backing, but this shows exactly the 
the stitching. And you can see the stippling stitch, these little half circles that she created, some of the outlines of the poppies. She didn't fill those in. And then the grasses. It's almost as pretty on the back <laughs> as it is on the front as a sketching look. So the fabric sometimes tells you what stitching or how to outline or do the stitch. Exactly, Nancy. Up and down for grasses, around for sky, mm -hmm. and leaving a little, leaving the flower petals unquilted makes them protrude forward and gives a dimension to your quilt. And I know sometimes you go around them twice to give mm -hmm. a little bit more emphasis. Let's look at our future quilt for this series. Um, this was the poppies outside my window. Because the border had the wood look, Natalie, here you just followed the grain of the wood and just stitching, following some of these right. light and dark areas. I even, uh, by, by doing that free motion rather than with the, with the feed dogs up, gives it a little more random rough look. Mm -hmm. In a few minutes, we're going to have a showcase of a few other of your quilts, and this is one of them, but we're just going to show you the detail. On this quilt, I want you to look at the stippling, how close together she has it, just in this area. She really did it, Natalie, you did it so closely. It is just an art form in itself, the way you've done the stitching. Thank you. The border is interesting. I like this accent stitch on the border. What I do is raise my feed dogs when I get to the edge of the quilt before I begin the border, and I actually use the dual feed mm -hmm. on my machine to stabilize the quilt all around. And it's stitched right in the ditch. Right. But then you do a second row of stitching. Right. Just the width of the presser foot. It gives a nice accent to the quilt and ensures that the quilt will be a perfect rectangle. It's like an inner border that you have mm -hmm. in this area. Then the outside border, you can see the stippling stitch and how even that has been done. That takes a little practice to get it that even. I'll, t I'll tell you that mine isn't that even, but it, it really, it can be random because that, that, that's what mm -hmm. that stitching is. The final stitching is to add the borders and use your favorite border technique. And here you can see that Natalie simply just matched, of course, the border fabric to the binding fabric. And the binding is sewn on the edges. And now you get to see this quilt in its full view. Now you can see this spectacular quilt in full view. And you've named this quilt. Poppies Under the Olive Tree. Let's take a look at your inspiration for this quilt, because Natalie always starts with a photo or a snapshot. And this you took on a recent vacation. Yes, uh, my husband and I went to Israel last March. And it was spring in Israel, and the poppies were growing wild. And I was very touched by what wonderful mm -hmm colors they created in this meadow. And surrounding the meadow, of course, were the old, ancient, ancient olive trees. So I combined both the tree concept that I had developed in my earlier series yes. with landscapes with the close-up fl uh, flowers. And this is, in a sense, a bug's eye view. It's like you're sitting down in the meadow and looking up at this glorious tree. Let's let, take a look at the leaf area, because we have some shading that you did with some highlighting of park marking pens or fabric pens. This is a fabric that I've used many times because it has such fine leaves and sometimes I used it right side up. Here I used it wrong side up and here as you as you suggested Nancy, mm -hmm. I actually painted it with a little yellow. Here's another quilt. You have so many quilts and this has more of of course the larger flowers. This quilt is from the collection of Gail McCallum. And in this quilt, I left the border off totally because I liked the, the contemporary mm -hmm. feeling that the poppy swinging created. And these poppies, because of the way you stitched, just highlighting the poppies and stippling heavily around it, they just kind of burst out from this quilt. I think that's the advantage of doing a great deal of, of free motion quilting on these pieces. It's a wonder just to look at these. They're so beautiful. Thank you, Nancy. Before closing this series, I'd like to show you one more of Natalie's great quilts. Thanks, Nancy. This one I call irises. It's from the collection of Mary Sella and features three different kinds of iris fabrics. It's been an inspiration having you here. I've already tried a couple of these techniques. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And I hope you've enjoyed this series as much as I have and will try your hand at flower garden quilts. Bye for now. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. 
Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira Threads, designed for home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmoor House, publishers of sewing, quilting, and craft books. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions. And Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.